This journey through the vagaries of civilization begins in Vancouver, stepping stone to an adventure on the northern coast of the American continent where everything is possible. I'm answering the call of the forest, the wide open spaces, the last remaining landscapes where nature is still king. I begin my journey by road, traveling the length of Vancouver Island up to Port Hardy. Then I'll take the ferry to Prince Rupert on the Canadian border and head on to Ketchikan in Alaska. Behind the trees, I see areas of deforestation. But not all of the local inhabitants seem put out. It makes me wonder, though. Does this spell disaster for the bears? No. In fact, there's some good news at this sawmill between the highway and the sea. It's the timber industry which is under threat here. Canada has introduced new regulations, considerably reducing the felling of trees, and that's good news for all mammals. At the tip of Vancouver Island, Port Hardy has a more descriptive name, which is an invitation to travelers, the place where the highway ends and the adventure begins. Ferries are good places to meet people. Now I'm going to Prince Rupert, and from Prince Rupert, I will then uh, take the Alaska Ferry to Skagway and two month trip in the Yukon in Alaska. So. Are you a student? Yeah, I'm a student. Yeah. What, what are you looking for there during your trip? I don't know, just freedom and adventure. I will really appreciate to swim in the Arctic just for a thrill. You know, I've, I've, I've swam in like all the other oceans except the Indian, but in the Arctic it will be a great experience. And just the wilderness. And That wilderness is starting to take shape before my eyes. It's as vast as a whole continent, taking in the Great North, Canada, and the United States. This land's shared myths inspired travelers such as Jack London. He was transported by the natural wilderness, in which he recognized the origins of freedom. The route I'm taking isn't for tourists, it's for travelers. We traveled one year from Germany to Bangkok, and now it's second year going from up to Alaska and then all the way down to Argentina. Each traveler follows his own path and each has a particular viewpoint. Joachim von Leuven has already journeyed through Africa and Asia on a motorbike. He's writing his second travel book. It's 108 pages already. Already? Yeah. What did you write today? Uh, I'm writing from yesterday uh, and the day before, what uh, happened in Vancouver. I wanted to camp wild, and then I decided that I don't do it because I was afraid of the bears. Then I went to the, in the Pacific Rim Park into the proper campground. Did you meet some bears on the, along the road? Not yet. But everybody tells me about it, and I read about these things. And since I'm only in a tent, you know, it's very sharp, the toes of the bears. So I think it was better for my feeling to go on a proper campground. Are you, are you afraid of bears? Uh, maybe it can uh, come that I will camp wild, but right now I'm afraid of it, yeah. I learned that Sebastian is from Quebec. I'm curious to know what he's doing. I'm a biologist and a microbiologist. I completed my first degree last year. What's your ambition? Good question. 
I don't know. It's the realisation of a childhood dream. The ultimate journey. I've always dreamed of the Yukon, since I was seven or eight. It's the call of the wild, wide open spaces, and freedom in a way, the wow factor. What I find exciting, and what's a bit scary too, is not knowing where I'm going. Freedom, above all. A hundred years ago, this was virgin territory, inhabited only by its indigenous peoples, living in freedom. It was conquered thanks to three different kinds of fever, the gold rush, salmon fishing and the canning industry, and forestry. Each bout of fever was followed by a period of near desolation, but each depression gave way to a new project, a new fever, new enthusiasms. Prince Rupert, the last town before the Alaskan border and the last port of call for the ferry. Everyone disembarks and Sebastian sets off on a camping trip in the mountains. Bye. Established a century ago, the town prospered thanks to a fish cannery employing 2,000 people. 200 canneries were dotted along the Pacific coast. This is the only one that's still in working order. Some places became ghost towns forever, and others for an indefinite period of time before their fortunes suddenly revived. After losing a third of its population with the collapse of the timber trade, Prince Rupert has been reborn in the age of globalization with a new port and an influx of tourists. During my stopover, I take a regular hydroplane flight over the coast and into the interior with Francois, the best possible guide. When I speak French, we speak faster in French than in English. When I speak French and then switch to English, it comes out faster. It takes me a while to get used to it again. Over there is the largest town, 15,000 inhabitants. Maybe a bit bigger than Chamonix. It's the biggest town. Between here and Vancouver, you won't find anywhere bigger. We're talking a distance of 900 kilometers. Before, the local economy was based mainly on timber. But now, because the price of timber has fallen, lots of factories have closed, causing unemployment. But they built the new port last year. So it's just beginning. Boats have just started unloading. It's all new since last year. This is the nearest port to Asia. It's a day and a half less for boats to come here than go to Vancouver. I'll stay here for some time. I plan to be here, maybe to end my days here. I really like it, because it's on the coast. Everything you could want is here. The ocean, the mountains. In winter, you get beautiful snow. You're near Alaska. I like skiing and trekking. So I think I've found the place I want to live. I like it. I may not always be here, but I'm definitely going to stay in Northwest BC for a long time. By taking the scale of the landscape which lies before me, Swept by icy winds in winter and humid in summer, bare rock and reburgeoning rainforest stretch for 2,000 kilometers from Canada to Alaska. The call of the wild is irresistible. 
I want to plunge into this world, discover the land, and measure myself against it, and listen to what it has to tell me. The voice of nature here is loud and clear. I have an immense feeling of freedom in this verdant arena. It whispers to me that we can live side by side, that we can communicate. is inhabited by its natural guardians and by the spirit of the native peoples. I return to the good old ferry which will take me to Alaska and the ferry has its guardian too. I like the ferries. I'm a ferry boy. <laughs> That's what I told a woman. I don't like them cruise ships, I like ferries. You know, it's like, you know, I saw you on the other ferry, and uh, that was nice, so this will be fun too. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, I'm gonna go make my bed. All right. Right. By morning, we've arrived in Ketchikan in the 49th state of America. Bought from Russia in 1867, Alaska is one of the youngest states in the USA. It's also the biggest, and with 650,000 inhabitants, the least populated. A quarter of Ketchikan's 16,000 citizens are native Tlingit, Haida, and Simshan. This normally quiet little town is transformed when the good weather arrives. Since September 11th, 2001, Alaska has become a major destination for cruise ships. Ketchikan receives almost a million cruise passengers a year. Fortunately, I managed to meet two locals, born and bred. 13 and a half years old. We live, her and I live 16 miles out that way. We have to have a boat to get in. We're going home now. We've been in all week. Then we go home, no, no neighbors. No rent, no uh, taxes either. <laughs> what, what do you do to leave there? Uh, hunt deer and seal. Fish, uh, lots of food, lots of ammunition, lots of firearms. Real Alaskan. It's a good life? Oh yeah, as long as the government don't come out, good life. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> I've heard about a native village where they still carve totem poles and perform traditional dances. Wonderful, yes. We made a special trip to, to see this. Yes. It was really good. We're, we're from Texas. So we are a long way from home, too. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you. <laughs> I have a distinct impression that the traditions have been reinterpreted by the tourist agencies. There's nothing, there's no connection, you know, there's no soul. It's, I just think it's so sad. And people need to know. It's crazy. Why are they doing this? Why are they ripping people off? 
You know, I mean, Alaska is beautiful and there must be some beautiful culture and we just seeing this crap. In which direction does freedom lie? I continue my ferry trip through the inside passage towards Juneau and Skagway. Alrighty, folks, it's safe to go down. Please stay on the yellow, follow the yellow brick road. Ignore the man behind the green curtain. Don't get squashed. That's commandment 11. Thou shalt not get squashed. Photo ID. As we embark, I meet Sebastian again. He's also banned for Skagway, the legendary starting point for the gold rush. He's also made progress on his inner journey. I'm remembering the physical effort it took to climb Deer Mountain. It seems like nothing. Watching the birds, the grace and the ease with which they fly, but also the physical feat of beating their wings. I realize that the efforts of human beings cannot be compared to those of birds. If we observe nature, we can see that our human difficulties are nothing compared to those facing the animal kingdom. We should remember when man was an integral part of nature, when the thinking animal knew how to respect his fellow creatures. What great transformation happened within our evolution, which didn't occur in other evolutionary paths, other animals, to make us believe we are so different, so superior. Inspired by these wise words, I feel a desire for high altitudes. I think this is the most amazing place on the planet. I mean, I honestly feel like it's a big playground, but for adults. <laughs> you can look at rocks, you can you know, be a geologist and an adventurer and um, you know, a hydrologist looking at the water all in one day. Um, you can come right up over the top here. I go to school, yep. I'm studying philosophy. <laughs> I think being, being out in nature, being really knowing that you're removed from civilization is one of the most profound realizations you can have. And for me, Alaska, you don't have to go very far. You know, you can go a couple miles from town and suddenly you're in the wilderness. Like you're really out there and there's just nobody and nothing and there's no sounds other than like the ones that are you know, in nature. I find that exhilarating. I mean, I think that's much more exciting than any fast car or, you know, anything you can do in a city, um, which is why I keep coming back to Alaska. <laughs> I'd like to follow Lisbeth across this white landscape, but my road lies in the other direction, on the water. The glaciers feed the rivers and sculpt the mountains. In the process, rocks are split open to reveal veins of quartz which yield up flakes and nuggets of gold. It was in these mountains that they found the first nugget which launched the gold rush. When it's in the water, they call it placer mining. Gold that's placed into a stream um, due to erosion, you know, so it's placed into the water. Then they have load mining, that's the hard rock mining inside the mines themselves, inside the mountain. Late fall, after these mountains start freezing, 
You don't get much water coming down again, okay? This creeks come down, not as much water in them. Easy to get out there and find gold. Some people say that it, you know, that that's, it doesn't mean anything but finding it and you're really not looking to make a profit. Well, if I find gold, like I do, find small nuggets, and as she knows, we actually um, can sell those nuggets to jewelers. Jewelers make uh, bracelets, earrings out of those. So yes, it's profitable, okay? Now, are you gonna make a lot of money? No, you won't make a lot of money at it. If I made a lot of money, I would have been retired a long time ago. Like all Alaskan towns, Juneau sprang up during the gold rush, and there are still plenty of jeweler's shops for the cruise passengers. Like on the, uh, the smoothness of them. You know, you can tell this one has actually come down um, the mountain and has been in a lot of water. A lot of the value in that nugget is in the form that it's in. Yeah. If you were to melt that down, you would lose a lot of the value, yes because it's the rarity, it's the shape that it's in, it's natural, that's how it's found. I'm on the trail of the gold diggers who traveled from Juneau up the Lynn Fjord, the longest in America, to Skagway. In 1897, the town was established in just a few days as 100,000 men were drawn to the area by rumors, dreams, and desires. Today, Skagway has only 800 inhabitants, but 12,000 tourists a day pour off the cruise ships in summertime. Idling on the quays are six trains waiting to take the new explorers on their pilgrimage. I'm in the heart of the tourist industry, where everything is organized, mechanized, safe, and above all, profitable. Are we on TV or something? Maybe. 15 minutes. The train over the Chilkoot Pass is a full-scale attraction and the biggest in Alaska. 450,000 passengers come each year to breathe in the pioneer atmosphere, the spirit of adventure, and America's history. For Americans, always alive to symbols of their past, it's one of the country's major sites. Each prospector had to bring with him all of his equipment and enough food to live for a year. Those were the rules. There were pack horses, sledges pulled by dogs, and also men who were crazy and impoverished enough to attempt the climb with 90 kilos of baggage on their backs. myths, they are religions. I find Sebastian off the tourist route at the foot of the Chilkoot Pass and the start of the Gold Diggers Trail. He's preparing to go climbing for five days alone. There's still a lot of snow on the ground, so we're talking. I don't know. The forest wardens say it's a few meters deep, so I've got snowshoes. What sort of animals are you expecting to meet? Bears. If they're in the distance, I'll watch through binoculars. I'll take photos. If they come near me, that's when you try to talk to them. You talk to them and put your hands above your head. You try to make yourself look bigger and tell them to go away. You retreat slowly, always keeping your eye on the bear. Never turn your back on him. If that works, that's great. If 
If it doesn't work and the bear comes closer, you've got the fetal position if you can't move backwards to get away. And then if you're really in close contact, the survival instinct kicks in. This is where our paths diverge. I leave Sebastian to continue his journey of self-discovery. I return to the ferry for a final sea voyage to Haines, where I'll take to the road. Viva la France! Viva la Republic! You can't help making friends on the ferry. Liz was adopted by the Klingit. She says I should pay a visit to this native people. Don't forget there's a little Indian village called Klukwan. That's the village where I was adopted. Our tribe linked up with the people from Klukwan. It's really an extraordinary place. Who should we see in Klukwan? Sally. Sally is his wife? Sally. She's an Indian woman. An Indian village today bears little resemblance to the ones in the picture books, but appearances can be deceptive. The vast piles of what looks like junk around the houses is simply a sign that no one around here throws anything away, because everything can be used again another day. I arrive at the home of Liz's friends, Sally and Val. <laughs> Egypt. I said, I would like very much to speak my language to you, to give it to you. I know it's two different worlds. Uh, this here, the Tlaquan, is an Indian village, and Juno is a white man community. And I was born in a, a government hospital under the uh, BIA and that's how I was born in Juneau and raised here. So I lived in two worlds. I went to school in Juneau but my livelihood was here. When I was growing up nobody knew how to read, nobody knew how to write, Nobody knew how to speak English. So we were punished if we didn't uh, learn the English language. And we were punished in, in school for speaking our own language. So when I uh, grew up, I'd tell people I was a minus F student below failure because I was too strong-headed. I refused to give up my, my language. My husband, uh, Valentino, his name is Gustehin. That means the calm waters behind the dorsal fin. He is my true love. They are eager to show me the treasures of their culture. Valentino has been accepted by the Klingit. He even attends the very private village council. But what intrigues me is how an Italian came to be living here. Okay. I was working on the, a love boat, went to Juno, and there we met. And five years later, we got married. <laughs> and I quit to travel to working there because uh, I didn't see no reason to uh, still traveling and be married. Uh, <laughs> I want to be with my wife. <laughs> now I uh, even at school over here, they brought back the language. So that is a good beginning. And also we had cl a few classes uh, of, um, to train um, uh, carving. Uh, and uh, me and her, we, we are part of the carving and also um, beading. Yeah. Her culture is alive, still alive, it's coming back. 
I would have liked to stay longer with Sally and Valentino, but I must get back on the road. The next stretch is the 1800 kilometers from Haines to Haines Junction and through the Canadian Yukon before crossing into Alaska again and heading for North Pole. Where are you going? Uh, to Haines Junction. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Where are you from? From France. You speak French? Yes. Me too. I'm Canadian. It's still possible to be a young hitchhiker in these parts. Natalie comes here every summer to climb mountains. At the Chilkat Pass, she shares her passion for these mountains, which extend as far as the eye can see. Here are all the mountains. They're pretty high. You get to the top and see another. Climb that, and there's another. You say to yourself, I want that one, and that one. You look at them and think, I can ski down this side, that side. There's the glacier. It's endless. Everything is possible here. Everyone you meet has done something crazy or incredible. Everyone tries to do something crazy. So you go off on a trip for two weeks, and it's the craziest thing you've ever done. Then you speak to someone, and they've done something three times more incredible. But they don't tell you to make you feel small. It's just normal. People just... <laughs> nothing's impossible here. The St. Elias Mountains and the Cluane National Park cover an area bigger than Switzerland. Not counting the North and South Poles, it's the biggest ice field in the world. This place is timeless, a world without limits. I feel as though I'm the first person to set eyes on this untouched and uninhabited landscape, that I'm alone, aware that under the snow, nothing will change for hundreds or thousands of years. It feels as if I can touch this landscape, as if my body no longer exists, and I can plunge into this space to lose myself and find myself anew. I'm in luck. There's a bluegrass festival going on in Haines Junction. Top of the bill is Michael Cleveland and his band, a blind virtuoso who was recently voted the top folk violinist in the United States for the seventh year running. bluegrass music on paper. You gotta play from from within you. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's a soulful kind of music, you know. It's music of a lot of expression. You know, you can improvise and do all kinds of things with it. I, I love it.
traveling together. We have two brothers and friends. And so we're traveling. And we're following the Yukon Gold Rush, too, because they have a grandfather that had a gold rush in British Columbia, or a site. Yeah. And my grandfather went from Sweden to the Yukon. And so we're going to be following that, too. Our six traveling companions are three couples. Each couple has their own mobile home and a 4x4 on tow. Six vehicles for six people. It's very nice. <laughs> Lots of room. We have slide-outs that open up, so you have there's more space in there. Have you ever been and inside have we, one? Have we told? Never. Would you like a tour? Oh, you like to see uh, how it works? I would love it. All right. Okay. 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 Let's, Let's go. go. We well, told, I need an hour to homes. dust and mop and we polish and <laughs> we wax floors. We tow a vehicle so we can unhook and, mm -hmm. and travel some of the back roads. And we have our bicycles, mm -hmm. just like the French do. They love their bicycles. Marsha, are you ready? Marsha? Please come right in. The microwave. And this is the stove under here. And no dishwasher. I'm the dishwasher. And then this is the bathroom. The bathtub, shower. So it's fun. That's that's the difference of it all. So we we travel comfortably for us. Maybe not for some people, but it works well for us. Nice for us, but not so good for the planet. How much fuel do all these engines consume? So we have the gasoline. Our rig is gasoline. The other rig that you saw, that's um, diesel. And they get better gas mileage than we do. Now, mm. I know you have liters and kilometers, whereas we have gallons and miles. But um, it's, it's almost embarrassing to say we only get eight miles to the gallon when we travel down the road. But we can go about 400 miles before we need to refuel. So you watch the map and see where your next filling station is. We don't see fuel getting cheaper. So if we don't travel now, when are we going to do this trip? So we're all, we've all decided we're doing it. We're going. Um, but I don't know about next year. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> My journey continues, crossing over into Alaska and back into United States territory. Shortly before arriving at North Pole, I pass by a large American Air Force base. Of strategic importance during World War II and the Cold War, the 49th state was developed by the Army. Oh, where are we here? We're at North Pole, Alaska. And we're delighted to be here at North Pole, Alaska, <laughs> because our stepson is with the United States Army, OK, defending America and its allies, the French, <laughs> all right, against the terrorists. So you all can continue to drink wine, be indolent, and have great food and all that kind of thing, and not contribute to the war effort, OK? <laughs> However, I'm delighted with your new president. I understand he knows what we did with you all and the Nazis back in the 40s, <laughs> and hopefully there'll be some more good allied Franco-American cooperation to rid the world of these filthy terrorists. Now do you right? know why I do this? <laughs> it seems I'm entering political territory here, and the North Pole is at the heart of the Americans' America. In fact, one of the United States' greatest allies lives here. So I pay him a visit, just like the 340,000 other people he welcomes into his home each year. Uh, get my shoulder. What part? Port St. Lucie. Oh, yeah, so you're the over there, Port Lucie, yeah. 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 You know, I talk about the Red Wings. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yes. So you having a trip in Alaska? Yeah. Yes. So, so what are you, about the sixth grade, seventh? I'm going into the seventh grade. Seventh, yeah. Yes. God bless you. We just love you up here. Thank you. Yeah. Here you go, darling. For you. you get two because you're a princess. When you get your camera, come back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who do you think I am? <laughs> uh, this is my 38th year at Santa Claus. This is North Pole, North Pole? Where That's Christmas right. spirit is every day. You go in the rest, they got the street lights and candy canes. Every restaurant has Christmas thing. It's the spirit of Christmas every day here. Every day. 
I'm keen to understand why and how every day of the year can be Christmas Day in this town. It's an American legend that Santa Claus lives in the North Pole. That's been around for 100, 200 years, I don't know, a long time. And so uh, 55 years ago, the, the people who des decided to make this a city called it North Pole, hoping to attract a toy manufacturer. They didn't get the toy manufacturer yet. I'm hoping that we will. But Santa Claus moved here. He said the North Pole was too cold, moved down here p under the Arctic Circle. It can get up to 90 degrees, although it still gets 50 below. You know, and that's Fahrenheit. <laughs> so, but he likes it here. Well, let's go then. Off to the refinery. See, this is why they don't give me these cars very often because I play with them. <laughs> Look, we can even make it. We can make it whale or yelp or hyper yelp. Not bad, huh? <laughs> Doug Isaacson takes me on a whirlwind tour that gets more surprising at every turn. I haven't got them to do have an elf occasionally, you know, have someone dress up like an elf. Not all of them, just yeah. one or so. So where we're going is um, a radio TV station called King Jesus North Pole. It was started over 50 years ago. They've got uh, 50,000 watts of, of radio power that during the Cold War, uh, especially people in Russia would listen to at, at midnight or midnight, and they would beam gospel programs in Russia. Sooner to hour later. <laughs> <laughs> The mission is to uh, get the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ out into the villages, and uh, a lot of a lot of the places in Alaska. Our 50,000 watt carries quite a quite a distance, and we have AM, FM, and television, or FM and television, and uh, a lot of villages out there, the native the Eskimo and Indian villages, do not have a uh, representative of the gospel out there. And the radio, there's no stopping of the radio waves. It just goes, and they turn on the radio, and it's there. And uh, so our mission is with the uh, Eskimos and the Indian people. That is cool. People of North Pole intrigue me. I'd like to know a bit more about them. Hey, I, I see why two guys fall in behind you. I don't blame them. That's the best way to be. Come on. Every eight, thank you. Oh, jeez. We're by the farmer's Inside a traditional house, I discover a way of life that hasn't changed for a hundred years. Now, did you guys, I know that's my mom's stuff, though. That's but your mom's book. I don't remember. Did you catch all these, or are these furs that you... Yeah, Frank. No, Frank caught all these. Oh, yeah. Frank shot them, and he, most of them were on the trap line. Okay. That he got. Um, it's kind of scary. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen it before. I've never been in a house where there's animals on the wall. So, it was kind of different, and it took some time to get used to. <laughs> but I got used to it, because... <sighs> Yeah, you have to, <laughs> so. People here still live from hunting, fishing, and forestry, the famous right to freedom American style. The right to bear arms and use them in hunting, in self-defense, and even in order to impose your culture and your will. I have an uneasy feeling in this displaced North Pole. Do the combined missions of the U.S. Army, Religious Radio, and Father Christmas really provide an answer to the concerns facing the world today? 
I sometimes feel I understand things when I'm traveling, even if I'm just passing through. But first impressions are often accurate. I hear that in April 2006, a massacre was averted at North Pole's primary school. Six pupils aged less than 12 years old had planned to murder their teachers and some pupils they didn't like. A roll call of 20 potential victims. The plot was foiled in time. All is not necessarily well in Father Christmas's hometown. My journey continues through Fairbanks and the University of Alaska, an echo of the icebergs and igloos of the Great North. But tonight, I'm looking for something a little cozier. time. Certain presences linger here. Well, this house was re-enacted as it was back in 1916. I had to bring back the life that was in this house. The energy is actually a vortex of energy here. Um, it's soothing, it's uh, peaceful. <sighs> we had help making this house. Uh, we had help from uh, Elmer. Elmer is the spirit of this place and it's a huge spirit it's huger than the house uh well there's one spirit here called claire and a lot of people feel her energy when they come into the house it's a playful energy and it's she's very fun and uh, like for instance when i was putting up the light in the dining room I had the grandkids at my feet and my sweetheart was outside the window and all of a sudden the very heavy kitchen door swung back and forth. It's easy to believe that spirits leave traces behind, show themselves to the open-minded and even bond with them. They travel too. The road takes me through the Denali National Park, one of the biggest conservation areas in Alaska, at the foot of the highest peak in North America. Denali is a mythic place, which the natives called the High One. Man does not seem to have disrupted the calm that reigns here. A trail 160 kilometers long threads its way through the taiga and tundra amidst unspoiled nature. I finally discover the origins of the call of the wild, which I've been pursuing ever since I left Vancouver. My journey is supposed to end in a city, Anchorage, it's not so far away now, a mere 700 kilometers. At the end of the Denali Trail, there are no more roads or paths. There's just getting together with nature. Stay here. 
something inside me still hears the call of the forest, the call of the universe. I hear it in the earth, in the bark of the trees, in the water and the rocks, like the heartbeat of nature. Freedom is not a myth, but a voyage which lets us stray from beaten paths and enables us to cross rivers. It allows our spirit to soar and pursue its own inner journey. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you.